Hi there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. So we got another glimpse of Star Wars Squadron in the recent CG short, Hunted. And I gotta say, I am starting to finally get excited for this game. Now I know it's EA and literally every game they make is like a dolphin gangbang. It smells fishy and is full of broken dreams and promises. But I will give them this, they do make beautiful Star Wars games. Even though the Battlefront series is light on gameplay, it sure looks beautiful and allowed me to relive some of the most iconic moments in Star Wars history. And now that Squadrons has VR, the immersion aspect is really appealing as long as I don't projectile vomit everywhere. So we will try to do a playthrough of the single player mission for all of our fans out there who might not be getting the game but are curious about the story. Now what I love about this hunted trailer for Squadrons is it does an excellent job at giving us a glimpse of what it's like being a loyal Imperial in the last years of the Galactic Civil War. Today I want to expand upon this and give you guys more background information on what it's like to be an Imperial pilot after the Battle of Endor. Now, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below. Even if you have in the past, you might have gotten unsubscribed because of various YouTube algorithm magic. Because in our next episode, we'll be looking at the Rebel side of this video. The death of an emperor in an autocracy is a troubling event, especially when no clear line of secession is created. Although efforts were made to control the flow of information out of Endor after the Emperor's death, eventually the news was pretty widespread and uncontainable. Despite the fact the Empire and its military forces still outnumbered the Rebel Alliance significantly and held much more territory, population, and resources, things actually quickly began to fall apart. This is probably due to the environment the Emperor and his Sith ideology promoted. Whether it was in the Imperial Academies or in the Navy itself, the Empire's culture was a savage one where individuals constantly were seeking to gain power and destroy potential opponents, even fellow Imperials. This was especially true before the Battle of Yavin when the Empire lacked any true opponents and peace and stability just encouraged corruption and infighting. And so predictably, when the Emperor fell down a massive shaft and exploded, there was an immediate vacuum of power. Vader had also died and Grand Moff Tarkin had died during the Battle of Yavin. Masamita, the Grand Visor, aka Chief Operating Officer of the Empire, was technically in charge, but he barely had control of the world he was stationed on, Coruscant. And so the Empire began falling apart. Opportunist military and political leaders began gathering whatever resources, ships, and men they could get their hands on, and they either fled from the New Republic's uh, incoming forces or fortified an area and established their own personal fiefdom. One of the largest factions in the New Empire was united under Admiral Ray Sloan. In half of Squadron's main campaign, you will be serving in Titan Squadron, under the command of Varko Gray, who is under the command of Admiral Ray Sloan's Imperial faction. Ray Sloan is what you would consider a good Imperial. She truly believed in the cause and wanted to end the war, and bring stability to the galaxy and preserve her beloved Empire. But in reality, she was just a puppet for the shadowy figure known as Gallius Rax. So Gallius Rax was the secret protege of Emperor Palpatine, and he was basically tasked with carrying out the Emperor's last command, the Contingency Plan. Palpatine believed that an empire that could not protect its emperor deserved to be destroyed, because he was a psychopath. Obviously, had the average Imperial known about this, they probably would have defected in mass. The Contingency Plan had several parts to it, at its core was the destruction of the Imperial fleet through many different methods. Gallius Rax would, for instance, routinely feed the New Republic locations of Imperial convoys and fleets and literally set up ambushes for his own fleet. This allowed the much smaller and less well-equipped New Republic to take out a considerable portion of the Empire's fleet in the earlier days of the last year of the war. Another part of the plan was Operation Cinder. This was the Empire's version of Scorched Earth Warfare. Using a variety of superweapons, including weather-generating satellites, the Empire started destroying entire Imperial worlds so that the New Republic couldn't get their hands on it. It was also supposed to raise the price of victory for the Rebellion, or New Republic. Gallius Rax would eventually set up the Battle of Jakku by bringing up the bulk of what was left of the Imperial fleet to the planet and basically painting a giant target on it. During this latter period of the war, what Gallius Rax was actually doing was weeding out the weak, disloyal, and undisciplined. Whoever would survive the Battle of Jakku would go on to start a new empire. 
Although your average Imperial had no idea what Gallius Rax and the Emperor had planned for them, generally morale was still low and the aura of invincibility that had surrounded the Empire was slowly starting to erode. For the first time in its history, the Imperial military was facing an enemy that had both quantity and potentially quality on its side. In the beginning of the war, the Empire definitely enjoyed an advantage in both of these categories. The Imperial Academy and Imperial Pilot Training Pipeline produced some of the best starfighter pilots in the galaxy. But many of the most talented fighter pilots and squadron commanders had actually been posted on the first and second Death Star. The loss of both stations meant that many younger officers had to step up and take senior positions that they weren't necessarily prepared for. Admiral Ray Sloan was just the commander of a Star Destroyer at Endor before quickly rising up in the ranks. Now, the main starfighter in the Imperial Arsenal, the TIE Fighter, was also what I would consider a peacetime craft. It had an extremely short range and was mostly used for short-range interception. It was well-equipped to deal with pirates and other civilian threats, but its lack of shields, armor, hyperdrives, and heavy weapons made it very ill-suited for the larger battlefield. And as the rebellion continued to grow in size, the battles became more conventional and much more destructive. It was simply not possible for an Imperial pilot to survive multiple missions inside of a very flimsy TIE fighter. And not only was the Empire's logistical network getting messed up, so was its training pipeline, and so new recruits and replacements were drying up. And so TIE fighter squadrons, which usually enjoyed a three or four pilot rotation per ship, was now down to one pilot and one ship. With the Empire in full retreat and constantly under attack, Imperial pilots were now venturing out on multiple sorties a day without much sleep or rest. Burnout became a big risk and the Imperial fleets had to change up their strategy. The unthinkable was happening. Imperial fleets were now running away from the Rebellion. The Imperial Class Star Destroyer, once a symbol of the Imperial Navy's invincibility, was becoming a huge burden for the Empire's stretched supply lines. Capital ships were now half-staffed, half-equipped, and some were even running low on important munitions like proton torpedoes. But the makeup of the Imperial fleet had also changed as Gallius Rax and the Emperor intended. The weak and unskilled and inexperienced perished in combat. The cowardly fled at first opportunity and either surrendered to the New Republic or kind of disappeared into the Outer Rim. The morally guilty ones were disgusted by the Operation Cinder's plan to destroy loyal Imperial worlds and defected in mass to the Rebellion to help stop the Empire. What was left within the Imperial fleet were some of the most fanatic members of the Empire. The more realistic surviving Imperials understood now that defeating the New Republic and retaking the galaxy for the Empire at this point was a lost cause. And so what they focused on instead was vengeance. The roles had completely reversed. The Rebellion had rebranded themselves the New Republic and they were no longer carrying out guerrilla attacks and hit and runs on Imperial convoys. They now had to actually hold territory and govern, which is a lot harder to do. The New Republic was now learning firsthand that it's much harder to run and protect the stability of something than it is to destroy and disrupt it. And now Imperial Starfighter pilots were acting like rebel Starfighter pilots. They targeted soft New Republic targets like gas refineries, trade routes, and space stations, units like the infamous 204th Imperial Fighter Wing, otherwise known as Shadow Wing, terrorized Republic worlds, carried out brutal civilian massacres, and was able to cause a massive amount of damage to New Republic infrastructure. The 204th was a fast and small unit based around an Imperial class Star Destroyer and four Quasar Fire class carrier cruisers. Many of the Imperial Remnant squadrons were also set up in this way. The Imperial Remnant commanders were smart and savvy. They didn't risk their men and material to unnecessary risks. They understood that they were now the underdogs and they let go of that foolish Imperial pride. The once mighty Imperials were now scavenging for replacement parts for their TIE fighters and hiding on asteroids. This made them hungry and extremely dangerous. I think it's gonna be really awesome, guys, seeing what it's like to be an Imperial in these last moments of the Galactic Civil War, where the roles have completely been reversed and we kind of start seeing things fall apart all around us. So guys, stay tuned to our channel. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button so you don't miss out on our Rebel Pilot video, which we'll probably do next. And also stay tuned for our Let's Play of Star Wars Squadrons. Well, guys, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.